I try and like not to like misrepresent myself in terms of like you know videos I upload or anything like that because obviously I have to play live in front of you know thousands of people. If you had yeah. to make a name for that, a name for that color red, what would you call it? Slash red, probably. Oh my! <laughs> we're trying not to compare his guitar to Slash. You no. I don't know if I yeah. necessarily stand out as a player as much now if if I was starting to come out now in the in the current sort of like scheme of things. I just didn't. I mean, I had a guitar and he had a guitar, and I just shut the f up and just <laughs> I was just watching him. You know, like he's just ripping. Hey everybody, it's Derek, aka Mr. Shred with Masters of Shred, and we are here at the Nashville Shred Den with a very special guest, and I'm happy you all tuned in because you're going to want to see this. It is someone who's been on our show once, twice before. I sewed a vest for this man back in 2018. We'll talk about yeah, that. Yeah, right? yeah. Right? All right, give it up for the UK Shred Master, one half of the Shred Tag Team Supreme of Five Finger Death Punch. I think you know who it is already. Give it up to the mighty Andy James. <laughs> How's it going? All right. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Can yeah. you kind of play us in a little bit? Yeah, why not? All right. Uh That's what I'm talking about. That is <laughs> monstrous, man. And you've been warming up here a little bit, too. Yeah. We kind of threw everything in the kitchen sink at you well, in this room. Well, you literally handed me every guitar that you have in this place. It did. And, and, and they're all, like, this low action. And I'm like, fuck, it's just, it's my kryptonite, that is. That's true. Like having, having old strings, like, literally, I, I can't do it. I mean, honestly, you see the action in this thing. Like you can, you know. Dude, it is it is so high. That's my kryptonite, that guitar. Right. I tried to play this thing. You threw me off with the seven strings. I, I still have to get my head around that. And then the action just murdered me. Right. I couldn't play a lick. It, but it feels so good, though. It still feels so good. And you were telling me this. It sounds great. Yeah. Higher action, right? I mean, it just gives you a bit more like low end, a bit more separation in the notes for me anyway. Um, plus, both my hands sync up a little bit better. But everybody that picks up my guitar, they kind of think that my guitar tech doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> But it's just like, no, that's, that's how he has it, you know what I mean? Like, but um, yeah, I just, I've never been someone that can have like super thin low action. I'm not much of a legato player anyway, so I just hammer everything with the pick. Like. One of the most dangerous pickers in the game. Well, I don't know about dangerous, but yeah. <laughs> very good. You didn't have a pick, you got problems. Very good. Very cool playing, dude. I mean, you, you just killed it last night, too. And that's, and, that, and that's the new pick. Yeah, this is the new ones that I had. Um, done not make. I've been kind of toying around with these like triangle picks for a long time, um, just because like recording and stuff, they're really good for um, you know like tight sort of clean playing and stuff like that. Um, but playing in Death Punch, see here's the thing: like I have like these bands that I play in that I need a pick to do like multiple different things. With the with the flow picks, what are the signature at the moment? They're great for just like doing really smooth shredding and stuff like that. But I've been finding that. Um, you know, more and more, the application of that is just not helping me out. Yeah. It's great for like just doing instrumental stuff. If I was going to do a whole tour of that, then I probably would use more of that sort of thing. But these picks are great for like clean picking. I remember those flow picks soling. too. Yeah, yeah, a little bit smaller than those too. Those are a little bit bigger, right? Those are like a big triangle. Yeah, they're like pick. two mil, uh, two mil. Thick but also, the shape overall one. is far different than a regular. Yeah you know, pick that people are used to. But I'm no good with regular picks either. So the, the good thing about these is the, the shoulders on these are slightly wider, so you, it gets you a bit of a smoother roll off. Wow. I think Frank Gambale uses like triangle picks for like his mega sweeping and stuff. Enough so said. It's good enough for him, it's <laughs> yeah. good enough for me. Enough you know said. I mean? yeah. yeah, and these are like uh, 0.88. Um, so they've got a little bit of a bend in, but. Right, which is another thing you kind of changed since the first time uh, we did an interview. You were using much thicker picks. Yeah. And now you've kind of gone more of that Paul Gilbert approach, which he's really low right. on the weight of his, yeah. but that's still substantially different. Yeah, what definitely. You're using. Um, and these are like old text triangles in in black. Um, not so good for throwing out though, because you can't see them. They probably hurt more too if it's in the dark and you hit someone <laughs> yeah, with them, right? Yeah, you, you may take an eye out. Can't see him coming. Yeah. Well, that's because like I mean, I tried to get some white versions of these, but I don't think uh, well, old text comes out kind of uh, cream coloured when mm. it comes out. You know, okay. So. Or are, do they sell those? No, no, not yet. I mean, I, I don't know whether this is going to be a another signature thing or Dunlop are just like 
sick of me changing my mind all the fucking time. You should get so, you should get a small batch just to do for your website. Yeah. As merch, right? I've got like five thousand of these made for tour just for, no just to throw them out. But. Dude, I, well, we let's talk about that. We saw you last night mm -hmm. at Bridgestone Arena yeah. in Nashville. Dude, the accuracy. I mean, again, with just the speed, the accuracy, the note articulation, high action guitar like that, firing on all cylinders, all of you guys. Right. Amazing performance. And you've been on the road for months now, right? Yeah, we've been, we've been out since, uh, I think, middle of May. Um, we've been out. We've had like two weeks off to go home and, you know, do a family thing or whatever. And then, um, and then we're back out again. We don't finish now until end of September, beginning of August. Wow. Like the, the the chunk of the tour finishes around end of September, and then we have a couple of like um, one-off shows. So the, the the bulk of the tour finishes around then, and then we've got a few yeah. a few different. I think there's like Louder Than Life. I think. Oh, Louder Than Life, Dad. That's in Louisville. Yeah. We're gonna be there. Right. Do you know Squiggy? Mm, no. Okay, we'll have to introduce you to Squiggy at the American Musical Supply Tent. Okay. Uh, I mean the the Music Experience Tent. Uh, we, I we may, which I think we actually are. We're gonna be. Uh, hosting or we're going to be one of the judges for their Shred con competition for three days. Oh, okay, sweet. So we're working like Saturday and Sunday, but uh, awesome. They always have the big booth there and they do signings. You do just signings there. People would freak, yeah. dude. You're here in Nashville. I want to talk about how you're now a permanent resident, in a way, to America. Yeah. That's when I spoke to you. You were coming in and out. I saw you first time. I think you were with, um, dude, were you with Angel Vivaldi on that tour in Lake Worth? Mm, that's right. Yeah. And there was another player. And uh, he was Chris in a... Chris Yes! Yeah. Scale the Summit. Yes! Oh, that's who uh, Charlie was playing for um, before he joined Death Punch. He was the drummer on that tour. No both kidding, Angel yeah. And, um, Dude, that was yeah. a long-ass time ago, huh? I, yeah, it was ages ago. Like, yeah, because I remember that was the first time I met you, and yeah. you stitched this whole AJ vest for me. Me like, and my buddy Mike made it, and we had not been introduced to the invention of a sewing machine yet. So <laughs> we sat there for hours doing it by hand and really trying to figure out how to tie a knot. Right. And we're like, dude, we hope this holds up. I, I dude, how's that? How's the thing held up for you? I, I mean, I, I still have it. You still have it? Okay. Yeah, it's hanging in my wardrobe. I mean, I, you know, I kind of. It's, it's a memento. You can look back. Yeah. It's an exactly. early career, like when you have an early signature model. Yeah. You have it. It's just a memento. Yeah. You yeah. know. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was that was the first time I remember. It was like in this weird, like kind of ghost towny Florida place. Yeah. I even remember thinking back then, you were like, oh, I don't want to stay here. I'm probably going to move soon. And yeah, that was like in that. Florida, right? Yeah, yeah, that was in the South Florida at that time. Right. You know, dude, it's crazy. You come out to Nashville, and we'll tell you just the opportunities here within our industry, substantial compared to Florida. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, it I was mean, it's great, the hub but of, like, country music here, isn't it? Like, really. Country, true. But now, what is country music, dude? Mm. It's got rap. It's got pop. It's got rock. It ain't a country from the '90s or the no, '80s, it's not. dude. It's cool though. Like I like. I it's like cool. It. So it's yeah. it's people always think oh, it's all country, like you know that kind of southern. It's not like that anymore. So no. it's it's a lot more modern than it ever used to be. Yeah. But like you still got guys like Vince Neil living out here, Mick Mars. You got the lit guys living out here. You got a lot of guys in rock. Mm. Um, um, I always get his name wrong. The um, guitarist and singer for Giant, Dan Huff. Oh, Dan Huff. Yeah. He's out here. Amazing. He's yeah. phenomenal, dude. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you got a lot of legendary players, but do you, I think it was the best decision leaving Florida, mm. coming to Nashville. Right, yeah. Hands oh, we, we always have a good time there. It's a really nice place to be. Right? Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about Vegas, dude. You're yeah. in Vegas now. I'm a proper Vegasian, mate. So, I don't even know if that's what you call it. But right? Yeah, no, I've got my own ID card and everything. <laughs> so it's like I didn't plan on moving there, and then I was living with Zoltan for like six months before I got my own place, and then... Yeah, I guess I just stayed, <laughs> just left the UK and, and stayed in Vegas or whatever. But no, it's cool. You know, I've got my fiance and my dog like out and that's it. I'm super happy. You're going to go with the heat, yeah. but there's no humidity. Well, I mean, this is the thing. Like, I mean, we've been experiencing some mad humidity on this tour, um, you know, middle of summer, kind of being in the Midwest area. But I still take like the, the heat from Vegas any day of the week because you can still wear a, like 100 degrees, still wear a hoodie to the supermarket. I mean, people think I'm mental when I do that, but I'm not much of a t-shirt wearer, you know what I mean? I like to wear clothes. I don't like to not wear clothes. So I never, you'll never see me in shorts. But that's actually <laughs> good though, dude. You know why? Because if you stay away from the sun, you won't age as bad as most Americans do. Right, yeah. I mean, the I, sun will to destroy be honest, you. I don't, I don't tan anyway. I literally go like good for you. burn and then white again. I don't get the, <laughs> good the, for the, you, the dude. benefit of being in the sun. <laughs> I get it. So let's, let's talk something else in Vegas. We were in the car and we were picking you up and we were driving you over here. And I said, man, you ever heard of Ed Roman? And you immediately go, oh, of course. Yeah. You're looking yeah, at it. Yeah. 
Tell me about that, man, because everybody knows, you guys know about Ed Roman's legendary guitar store in Vegas, legendary builder. He built his own guitars, too, yeah. whether it's the J. Frog, George Lynch, Skull and Crossbones, some early Kramers that were really rare. He was the guy. Yeah. And whether you love him or you hate him, there's both sides of that all over the internet. We'll let you guys figure that out. Tell us about your relationship to him. Well, I mean, the, the, the store um, was... Put, well, put in my mind from my guitar tech, Roy. Um, he was just like, oh yeah, you know, you need any work done. I'll introduce you to the guys at Ed Roman and, you know, we'll get this guitar going. So I, I've, for the longest time, I've like always wanted a BC Rich Mockingbird, but I'm not like much of a, um, a six string player. Now I'm actually playing BC Rich guitars. I kind of thought it was a good opportunity to like do this custom build. Plus it's, you know, any anyone that remembers Slash playing this particular style guitar in the You Could Be Mine video, and that's the this is the guitar he uses live to, to play that song, and I always loved that guitar. So I was scouring the internet trying to find if they ever made a seven string Mockingbird because I don't, you know, like I say, I don't play six strings really. So seven string would be perfect for me because I could use it in the band and stuff and, and do a few songs with it. And then I did, I found um, a place in Australia that had it. I mean, it was super expensive. It was like four grand or something. <laughs> I was just like, I kept looking at it, you know, coming back and I was just like, oh, do you know what, fuck it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, you know, drop the hammer on it and buy it. So I did and it came. Um, and it was just all in black, uh, body mounted pickups, Floyd Rose, had like um, a load more different um, like knobs and switches on it. And then um, there was a slight crack in the neck as well that had sort of been badly repaired. So did you haggle the price at all? What's that? Did you haggle on the price at all? No, 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 no. This was just a reverb purchase that I just bought. From. Oh, reverb. Yeah, yeah. So it was just on there and I thought, fuck it, I'll just buy it. And then, uh, yeah, it came and it was, you know, it was playable. It was cool. And then um, and then it came to like modifying it because I wanted to put an Evertune in it, get rid of a, the Floyd Rose and stuff. I mean, I've been playing Evertune Bridges now for probably nearly 10 years. Right. So I'm so used to the way they are and they're just super efficient and, you know, they're great for me. It's very wild too because like you got a seven string on a Mockingbird and an Evertune. Yeah. Again, two things you don't ever really see on a Mockingbird. No, no, and I suppose some people might think it was like sacrilege to even do that, but I mean, if you could see on here as well, we've actually had like an acrylic step Yeah, it's got a riser, it, right? Just to bring the, the Evertune up to a decent, um, you know, to kind of my action height, um, <laughs> and also clear the pickups as well and stuff like that. So there was a lot of, uh, um, a lot of stuff that needed to be really thought out to make this right. guitar possible. But Alex, uh, Alex um, Ed Romans did a really good job with putting all this together. And then once all the work had been done on it and everything, the EMGs in there, the, the, um, the rearranging of the, the, uh, the volume control and the switch, Evertune, uh, then it had to be painted because it was all stripped back to like just the natural wood and stuff like that. Um, so I got put in touch with Dan Lawrence, who obviously is, needs no introduction. He's like a legendary paint guy done you know guitars for literally everybody yeah Zach um, Wilde and yeah, so yeah. a few right like almost yeah everyone yeah. exactly yeah so I uh I managed to get this guitar off to him and I think it was like an eight week period before coming out for this year uh, for the last European tour that we just did and he was kind of like well you know I'll, I'll really try and get it done but obviously he's a busy man he's got loads of other stuff going on but so I told him what I wanted like this particular red um which I think I saw on like a, a Jackson guitar because I was really struggling with the kind of red that I I wanted, because this is slightly different to the um, the original BC Rich Mockingbird that I wanted this modeled after. What would you call this red? Um, I've no idea. I'm sure it has a name, but it was on some Jackson Warrior guitar, I think. Really? Yeah, and I was just like, oh yeah, that's the red that I want. I think he paints guitars for Jackson as well anyway, so yeah. we knew exactly what the, the, the color was. And then I wanted these, like, um, the strips down there as well. And so, yeah, he managed to get it back to me, and I got it the day before we left for Europe. Wow. <laughs> so he wow. did it just in time. Yeah. You gotta wait, like, I don't know what the, what the lacquer is, but usually you gotta wait a little bit of time for the yeah, thing to Yeah, that's, that's the thing. Like, it wasn't a particularly difficult paint job. It's just obviously getting the thing to dry and, like, do it and, and do it in time. But If you had yeah. to make a name for that, a color, a name for that color red, what would you call it? Slash red, probably. Oh, my. <laughs> We're trying not to compare his guitar to Slash. You no, call I it know, Slash I red. Know. But, yeah, I don't know. Fuck. Anyway, um... <laughs> So yeah, you know, and he, he, uh, he really Ferrari did. Red is pretty good on this. Ferrari Red. And Porsche, yeah. the 911s, it kind of looks like that, which would be Guards Red. Right. It be Guards Red. I like it though, dude. It's a really good color on it. Yeah, thing. it's cool. And it, it really came together nicely. We've got uh, Planet Waves um, headstock tuners on here. So yeah, we, uh, we've got all the, um, the headstock. I think there's one headstock tuner. Yeah, a little bit of a chip down here. Ones. How'd that happen? Uh, oh. Horn. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a war wound, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a bit here as well. I mean, I don't mind, like, guitars getting bashed around. I'm not particularly, like, precious like that, you know what I mean? Like, they're going to get some scars being on the road and being used all the time. Right. Exactly. Plus, for the kind of show you guys put on, if that's all the scars you got, that's pretty astonishing. Yeah. You think you'd have a lot more. Like, if you've seen a Five Finger Death Punch show, I would think that things would be... Well, you did actually tell me that you snapped a headstock on one of your guitars and it broke the Evertune or something, right? No, 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 no. So, uh, one of the Metallica shows, I still need to show you the video, but um, I, I, for the longest time, it didn't turn up on the internet and I thought I got away with it. But then someone posted it up the other day and it was like... a matter of time. Yeah, so it was <laughs> raining, right? Um, and I had my foot on the, uh, the, the monitor. And then just as I hit the last chord, I must have put so much pressure on my, like my left foot that my left foot slipped. I fell forwards and cracked the headstock of one of my other guitars on the monitor. So it pushed it out of tune. So I had to, I had, this was my spare like backup, so I had to grab this guitar while my tech could, you know, retune it all up and give it back to me. Repair the headstock. Yeah, yeah well, no, it, I, you know, thankfully, <laughs> it's a testament to the build of, of my signature, BC yeah. Rich, because, yeah, it was relatively unscathed, you know, it was just out of tune a little bit. Let's talk about that. Your signature PC Rich really is a rock solid guitar. Yeah. I yeah. had the pleasure of picking up a couple of them um, from Franklin Guitar Works, which I, I did some of those posts with those guys and they get them in stock. Mm. And I'm like, well, outside of the fact that it weighs a good amount. It does, yeah. You know, do, let me ask you when, you, when you play guitar that heavy, do you like have to compensate with the strap, have any sort of special strap to maybe take the ease off the back a little bit? Um, I know you can get straps like that. I should probably look into it. But no, like, the only problem I have is uh, I have a, like a knee -ish issue at the moment with my right knee. But, you know, it's just kind of pulling like silly shapes on stage and stuff over a period of time, it's going to do that anyway. But no, not really. I don't have any like back issues or anything, yeah. but I have quite a wide strap on the thing, so maybe that helps. That helps, right? Yeah. It, ev it evens out the weight distribution a little bit. I think so, yeah. I always did think that, that those bucket head straps were like the answer, the number one ones that are elastic. Oh, yeah. You push down and it like goes all the way low and it pops back up again, right, yeah. you know? Like that's that's usually what I would be looking into, but like, because you, you played the Red Hawk earlier, it's got some serious weight to it, mm, you yeah, know? Right. Um, so it's always interesting with those kind of things. Mm. But I think definitely BC Rich could have something here with a signature model down the road. What do you Maybe. think? Maybe. I mean, a few people have, have kind of said, oh, yeah, that should be a model. You know, I'd buy that. Because you don't see too many um, Seven Street Mockingbirds knocking around. So I don't know. You never know. They might do. But this was just a, this was kind of like the 12-year-old child in me wanted to, like, do this. And, you know, I finally was able to find a guitar that I'd be able to use and and paint and do it and then play on stage. It's kind of cool as well, you know, because up to now I haven't really been somebody that does a lot of guitar changes on stage. You know, I usually just have the same guitar and then do the whole show. Right. But, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, like, get loads of guitars just in case I, uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to play this one for this song and this one for this right. song. You know what I mean? It has to have a purpose. But, yeah, you know, for this one, it's just a bit of a spectacle guitar for me to kind of play on stage for a couple of songs. How do you pay tribute to one of the greatest guitarists from one of the greatest rock bands of all time? In collaboration with the mighty Sam Hill Customs, Masters of Shred proudly brings to you the limited edition Super Halen 1x12 stack. Each cabinet is scientifically crafted with the highest grade materials to give you that monstrous tone that will light up the sky. Hand signed and dated by Sam Hill himself, these limited edition amps are limited to just 50 pieces. Draped in the pages of a vintage 1990 Van Halen comic book, the Super Halen is a showpiece that can rock like no other. Each cabinet comes fully loaded with a 12-inch USA-made Green Beret speaker, a total upgrade from the Celestian G12M Greenbacks that we've become so accustomed to. Each cabinet is closed-backed just like Eddie's, but we also offer open if you desire. With no two finishes being the same, you can be assured that your Super Halen amp is one of a kind. Visit www.mastersofshred.com now to reserve yours today before you can't get this stuff no more. I hear something different for you, okay? You bring up the 12 year old you. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's about. A couple million 12-year-olds at home right now that are saying, man, I wish I could shred enough to impress my friends in school. What would you, what would you show them to say, okay, this will get you by, kid. This will, this will work enough, and I can teach you this very quickly, and they'll get the impression that they can shred. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you did something like... <laughs> Yeah, 
yeah, you can do like one string tapping licks or something like that. Or, you know, if you uh, if you get good at picking or whatever, you know. <laughs> Sometimes bendings, you know, if you can bend properly. Right? You know, kind of riffing, yeah. any of that sort of shit. I don't know. Just keep it simple, stuff that's, you know, fairly manageable and easy to play. Right. I don't know if you noticed then, but I just bent a string and my finger went right under Oh the my thing. god. That's how high my action is. That happens sometimes. That's true. I don't think I could have an angle we can zoom in on that, because it did. <laughs> it literally goes right up. You might have been able to see it there, yeah. <laughs> that is great. Yeah, that happens this sometimes. Is, uh, and it, it does this. Look at that. You know, sometimes that happens. That's some like, high action, dude, yeah. huh? Yeah. It's impressive. You know, the good thing is you don't have to worry about people asking to borrow your guitar or anything like that. Oh, yeah, no one wants like, to play this. Like, <laughs> like, no way. No way. We're good, dude. We were finding something else the first act because they can't do the action. I think, That's the, a serious... I, I think the thing is for me as well, because uh, I did a, a jam video the other day with uh, Miles uh, Baker, who plays guitar for um, Ice Nine Kills. God, I was going to say nine inch, nine inch Nails then. They had that, someone put the wrong band name on the fucking poster. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but yeah, no, it was because he's a very sort of different player to me and we were looking at all the different things that he does that I do and we're very different in terms of like how we play. Because I have this like upstroke motion. <laughs> you know, so I, I, any two string stuff that I do is all upstroke. So I can't do the whole. Because you have to almost take the pick out and swing it into the string. Whereas I'm kind of more I, I pull in upwards like right. this, so I'm pulling in instead of swinging in like that. So it makes a lot of those things um, easier for me to play, but the action being high also allows me to kind of have more comfort in being able to rest stroke, pull my pick through the string. Right. So having a low action as well just doesn't really help me like in, in terms of being able to do that. And You know, like I've said before in many interviews, like my playing has been a, a gradual progression of just workarounds of like being able, or trying to do stuff that other people do, but having to do it in a very different way, mm -hmm. just in order to get the same effect. Because for some reason or another, my DNA makeup in my hands just doesn't want to do it the same as everybody else. So right. I've had to develop a lot of, um, so yeah, so basically I had this thing where if I'm playing an even note grouping of notes, so like six notes. <laughs> Um, I'd do it with an upstroke. But then if I um, if I have like an odd note grouping, then I start with a downstroke. So a you know, so I have to start with a downstroke instead. Which wow. is, so that's like my, my general system for playing guitar is if it's um, even notes, I'll start with an upstroke. If it's odd notes, I'll start with a down. Wow. Um, and yeah, that's it. Now, this wasn't always your job being a Shredmaster Supreme. While you were a Shredmaster Supreme, before you made the level you're at now. Right. Were you, did I hear right? Were you an insurance, were you an insurance salesman on, on the phone? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, selling car insurance. Well, before that, I, I think I worked in Starbucks. Uh, then I, I, I was Starbucks. Yeah, and then I was chopping lettuces for a summer in you know in a factory somewhere, and did a bunch of other stuff. I think um, hauling sacks of like monkey peanuts. Um, really? Yeah, I don't know. Just doing like really me. I mean, I didn't really concentrate at school, so I didn't really have. <laughs> that's that's, a, that's a wide range, dude. That's a wide range. So yeah, yeah. Trying to find my place in life, right? You know, all the while, you know, practicing like guitar licks and stuff like that. But um, yeah, no. Uh, I kind of had a bit of a Liam Gallagher moment one day, and I just said, fuck it, I'm just going to quit my job and try and be a rock star. Really? So I just walked out and left. I'm like, fuck this, took the headset off, really? threw it down and just left. No kidding. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't, I, I can't, I can't deal with being on someone else's clock, you know, being up at, you know, work nine to five, fucking doing shit like that. Um, and so I, I took a bit of a chance. I'd started teaching like local kids, just, um, you know, trivium songs and, and all that sort of stuff. And then, uh, I did a guitar competition one day and one of the guys that worked for Lick Library was judging it and he put me in touch with them and then that was my first kind of professional gig and then from then on it. That's right. And that was back in the day when like YouTube wasn't really as mm -hmm. saturated as it is now with like, you know, I don't know if I'd yeah. necessarily stand out as a player as much now if, you know, YouTube, um, if I was starting to come out now in the, in the current sort of like scheme of things, I mean, just 
the scale of and level of playing now is just insane to me. Like, you know what I mean? Well, um, also keep in mind though, back when you started getting on YouTube and it was at its primitive stages, mm. the post edit wasn't as strong in videos. Right. You know, you don't know who you're competing with is actually really being played, mm. or if it's not really being played. Yeah. Once you're in a room with them. Yeah, right. And there's a lot of players that get to that point where they get the call up and then they get sent right back home because oh, it's, it's nothing what I mean, yeah. they're doing it on at home in the post edit. Yeah. You can make anything look great, dude. Well, that's it. Yeah, I mean, like back in the day when I was doing YouTube videos, it was literally um, video camera with like mini tapes and just right roll it and just don't fuck it up. Thank you. No, the editing was not a big thing. No, like there no, wasn't. Well, I didn't know how to. I just, I just literally took the thing off the tape and uploaded it, and that's it. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. Didn't have any final cut or anything like that. Right. You know? yeah. So, so it's tough. You're right. It makes it a tougher environment if you're trying to get there now as a player doing like. This fretboard acrobatics. Mm. It's to a level where it's like, you know, you know, it's hard to decipher what you're really watching anymore. You know? Well, I mean, you know, you, you can quite easily pre record edited audio now and just make the fingers look like it's doing it and then and then upload it and go, oh, there you go. Right. And, and it is a much more saturated market. I mean, mm. you go on YouTube now, we're getting into it finally. I, I put all my effort into Instagram, as you know. You saw Instagram when I started it way back. But now I'm going into the YouTube thing. We went, we're doing much better than we were doing. I mean, we were at 7,700 subscribers for like whatever, what seemed like forever, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In the past year and a half, we're now about to touch 35,000. Wow. So it's gone just now. And yeah. then again, thank you everybody for subscribing. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel now. Um, so we're putting a lot more effort into it. But dude, when I, every morning I wake up, I go to YouTube now for like news, for events, for things I like, and I just look at the content being spit out. Mm. I mean, it's yeah, now people dedicate their lives to it. Their lives. Know? We don't yeah. understand the channels that are massive. You gotta be doing this every day. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. If we're not like a video every day of the week, I said, just understand. Most of the time, you catch them out in, in out in the wild. Mm. And I'm not offending anybody with well, this, okay? No, I mean, every, everything kind of has to be perfect as well. That's the other blood pressure nowadays because everybody's used to hearing perfectly uploaded content, perfectly recorded albums, perfectly recorded everything. Right. The moment anything has a little bit of scruff in there, you know, you like, and it makes you panic as like, because yeah. I never used to worry about it as much as maybe I do now. So I try and, I try and like not to like misrepresent myself in terms of like, you know, videos I upload or anything like that. Because obviously I have to play live in front of, you know, thousands of people. I don't want it to be like one of those things um, where like, it's like, fucking hell, this sounds nothing like, you know, the, the player that you promote yourself to be online or whatever. Although last night I did have a major, a major like thing, uh, I had to play the bleeding solo. Did you okay. saw it? All the fucking confetti went off, and then it landed, and all of it like weaved itself in my strings to the point where the, it was just squeaking. It looked great though. And then I just went, <laughs> <laughs> and I went, fuck it. If I'm gonna make a mistake, I'm just gonna wring all the yeah. strings out. And I was trying to get the paper out of the out of the thing, but. You know, things like that happen, and I guess you just got to have a laugh with it. Made but. for a great shot, though, dude. Yeah. We'll, we'll put that in there right about here. You guys can see that. It's just, it's epic, man. And just the recovery was great. It's mm. pro level, man. Well, that's the thing. I mean, like on this tour, we've literally had to play in all weathers. I mean, it was caning it down with rain for one of the Metallica shows. So almost to the point where we didn't go on because it was like thunder and lightning. And dude, stuff. dude, how was that? Playing with Metallica for you, man. Yeah, I mean, it's insane. <laughs> it's <just laughs> really insane, right? yeah. We were just talking about you were a car salesman, a car, sorry, a car insurance salesman yeah. on the phone, mm -hmm. which anybody that does telemarketing knows that's a far cry from where you're at right now. And that right. is a mental screw. Yeah. And you pick up the phone, you talk to people, dude. Whether it be hundred a day, mm. it is draining. Yeah, it's exhausting. I have experience doing it too, and my God. Well, I, I, the thing is, as well with, with that is like I would only usually get a phone call if someone was like angry with the fact that it didn't go right. So you're just doing, take it on every you. call is like it's as if <laughs> it's as if you were the one that caused them the issue. You know what I mean? Right. It's the same with like you know food retail. I mean, you get hundreds of people coming back like with their coffee, going, "There's too much foam in this. This is cold. Fucking heat it." You know. I mean, people are just. They just turn into monsters when they're hungry or thirsty. Right? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's right. So you worked at Starbucks too. Yeah. How was that? I mean, did they, did they, did they take care of you with benefits back then? Or? No, no. I mean, it was a really low paid like job and stuff. It just about covered the rent. I think like, after the rent and everything was paid, I lived on probably about 88 pence a week. No kidding. Yeah. So, it's not, so back then it was not seen as cool and trendy as it is today. 
I mean, I, yeah, I, no, not really. I mean, uh, it was just a job, really, for me. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I do gigs on weekends and stuff because I needed the extra money. Because, yeah. like, 88 pence a week would buy you a, a Tesco value loaf of bread and some tins of beans, and you try and make that last for the week so you just didn't die. So you could turn up to work and make people their coffee, you know? Right. Oh, my God. But, yeah, you know, like, so I would, I would, I would be in, like, pub bands and just be playing, like, covers and stuff and do, like, weddings and, and that. So that, was, that would be how I would get, like, a bit of extra extra money to try and survive right so but I mean I, I just didn't see it as a like a negative thing back then I mean it was just it was a, it was a challenge you know like um, whereas like now you know obviously I you know I have to like still work at what I do and stuff but life's definitely a lot easier than it used to be right but, and you do something you love yeah yeah exactly so that's always and you, and you built your own brand yeah you got your website you got your signature guitars I mean dude you're Playing the five finger death punch, mm. you know. And when that happened, by the way, I was so excited that you got that job in that band. Mm. I'm like, oh my gosh, hell yes! Because remember, I told you, I said, dude, you're gonna bring Shred back to mainstream, right? Because there wasn't, I mean, it wasn't there in a big arena band. You're talking mm. arena. And people say, oh no, Shred was always there. Yeah, yeah. If you want to go to a club, now you're talking about arena level. Mm. That's there's not a lot of people doing that, dude. There's no, not, no. I mean, it know? was definitely a you know a sort of transition for me, like, but kind of thankfully used to how that how that whole thing is now you know like going out and performing and you know playing I still am very much um, fairly diligent in just making sure that what I play is coming across well you know what I mean instead of you know just kind of half-assing it because I guess it would be easy to do that but I don't know I just I've always been OCD about that kind of thing anyway so I just want I want people to come and hear the stuff played as good as they can hear it being played, well, you know? I remember, dude, when you we did, uh, we did the Jackson, Gus G show mm -hmm. at NAMM weekend, gosh, just years and years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you opened it. Mm. And I, <laughs> there's some people I think they're probably, it's just probably normal at that time, they're like, these guys are opening up, who's this guy? And they look at your fingers, they're like, what the? <laughs> dude, it was just, it was all motion blurred. It was mm. blurred. Right. And the accuracy was just, even, even my brother, when he showed me back, back video, he's in the front row, he's recording, and he goes, dude, I, you can't even see his fingers moving. It's, just, <laughs> it's all blur. It's fuck. And the accuracy is just, like, right. devastating. It reminded me of when, like, um, I saw Jordan play with Rat when he got the gig in Rat. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I went to the House of Blues in Orlando, and you see all these I mean, worn... he, he makes it look effortless. Oh, dude, he... It's just... Dude, everyone and he's there. so cool, like while he's doing it. You know yes, I mean? everyone there was so angry to see him because they're all like diehard Warren yeah. the Martini fans, lifelong. Yeah. They were there and saw him back in the day. That's their guy. It's like, who's this kid coming out here? Yeah. He comes out, shirt totally just like open, looking up here. Guitar and, down to his knees. Dude, <laughs> eyes closed, down to his knees. Yeah. And you ever seen his next room? They are so fat and chunky, bro. Yeah. And he likes to play cold. Yeah. He doesn't play warm. He doesn't like his fingers warm. He likes it cold. So another, oh, really? I'm like, Dude, how are you playing like that? Like, yeah. with the guitar that low, fingers cold. Another incredible player. Mm. And I remember their faces. They're all like, their jaws were on the floor. Like, what the? F they were like, who's this guy? Yeah. <laughs> like, I love those moments. Yeah, I've yeah. been there for a few of them, so it's great to see that kind of stuff with yeah. you. Um, so, you're now in Five Finger Death Punch, and you have now toured the world, dude. Mm. You yeah. know? So, the past couple of years for you has been just a total change from last time I, I saw you. Yeah, so we, we, we've just um, done, a lot of, uh, done a lot of shows, a lot of touring, pretty much toured every year for the last sort of um, three years, I think. Uh, but I, I think like after this, we're, we're going to go back and like, do another record. Let me so. ask something. Do you get a solo spot like you used to do back in the day? Um, no, no. I mean, like the, the solo spot we have is the... Uh, the drum solo part, which happens in Burn Motherfucker. So the, the drummer gets that. And then, uh, you know, like, I mean, I'm soloing every song. I mean, you know, pretty much. I, I don't know if I really want to stand out there by myself and just play a bunch of licks, you know what I mean? So I, I, I'm, I'm one of these guys as well. Like, I mean, you know, in this sort of scenario, I oh, just play something. I'll be like, fuck, I don't know what to play. But I could, I'll play a song if, you know. Well, you also I'd much that, rather do it to music. I you've suppose. got a whole catalogue yeah. of music, dude, of instrumentals. You know, when uh, I believe this is right, you guys can correct me on this, but I do believe that when Steve I was touring with Whitesnake, he'd come out and bust out for the love of God. Right. That's a solo. It's yeah. like, why not? Dude, you could totally do that. Yeah. I mean, it could you do that. You got so many great songs, dude. Like, those albums, I mean, you could you could bust out that. And and not many bands are doing that anymore, dude. No. Not many bands that are current arena playing bands have guitar solo spots, which every damn guitar player had back in the day, dude. Mm. And you're on that level all yeah. day. Like, you should, I, how awesome would that be? Would you guys not love to see him do 
literally bust out a four or five minute solo <laughs> during a five minute. Hey, I think I probably would imagine the rest of the band would like it so they can actually. Have you know, break. have a break. Maybe, yeah. Regain the marbles, get I mean, back out of it, there, it, right? It could go one or two ways. It could be something that could be really cool, or it could just be the moment everyone goes to the bar. <laughs> you, know, you think so? Yeah, I don't this know. This guy, I don't know. No, yeah. I don't know. Well, you have to try and see. Yeah. 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 So let's tell us something else. You went a little bit back. You talked about Lick Library, and mm -hmm. that's true. Now, if I'm right on this, you were doing videos in the style of Nuno Betancourt, right? Mm -hmm. I did, yeah. I did a um, like a Quick Licks, Nuno Betancourt, yeah. Which is not easy to do, to play like yes. that. There it is, Mr. Nuno. Yeah. You like this wall here, right? It's pretty yeah, good, it's right? Cool, man. I got this on Facebook Vintage Marketplace. Magazine rack. Oh, and it, it's, it's tons, dude. Shred is dead. Joe Satriani on the front. Yeah. Iconic one, right? Um, but I got, I got so much. I love the ads. Different time, man. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. It's just great. Like, I want yeah. to go through these magazines, look at everything, and relive it. Happier times. Yeah. Um, this whole room is like that. By the way, how do you think about this natural shred then? Is it crazy? Yeah, it's cool, man. Like it's the, like the ultimate sort of shred wrestle, wrestling man cave. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. There's a lot of wrestling paraphernalia all over this place. There is, yeah. A lot of pop culture stuff, too. We've got mini me back there. Right. Little mini me doll, all sorts of wacky shit. Yeah, but um, it's it's fun. Basically, your childhood, you know, reincarnated. The Bucky's Bear as well. Oh, dude, yeah, yeah, I do the Bucky's Bear. <laughs> Sarah got that for me. We were yeah. literally doing a road trip. I think from fact from Florida, and I go to Bucky's, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that thing is huge. I know. It's I need one of those. I've only ever been one. I've been to uh, to one, but I, I got like a Bucky. Um, is it a beaver, I guess? Yeah, it is a beaver, isn't it? You got the onesie? No, no. Oh, no, okay. no. I, I, uh, I just got like the, the bucket hat, so sometimes I wear that. Like, oh, the bucket. You know what's funny? When we got that doll, no joke, for a solid week, it smelled like brisket. <laughs> and I'm so bummed that it doesn't smell like that anymore, dude. Oh, right, okay, right. so yeah, Nuno, you did all his licks, and then you also got noticed playing some Zach Wild stuff too, mm. right? Tell yeah. me about that. Um, well, yeah, we were talking about it earlier. This was this was before Lick Library, um, so this was like a, just a Radio One rock show. Send in your clip of like playing like Zach Wild, and then we'll pick like the winner, and you'll get to meet him in London. And because we drove past that Gibson place in Nashville on the way here, right? Yeah. So that's what sparked that story. But yeah, anyway, that was the first time I, I met him. Won the competition. It basically it was a it was a solo that I did to a backing track because I, I didn't like playing by myself. And the 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 radio station went, oh, can you just send it in without the the backing? And I was just like, yeah, okay. So I just sent in the solo minus the thing, and then they they played it on the radio and announced it all. That was kind of like the first. That was like the first penny drop moment for me where I kind of thought maybe I might have something that people like about my playing because I was just in pubs and clubs before that I mean you know people would say oh my god yeah you know you're a really good guitar player or whatever but then you just think oh yeah great you know thanks the the effort that I put in is is, right, is, right. Pay, is paying off but then you know for some reason doing like a competition like that I was thinking well maybe there's something in this and then I kind of started thinking at that point of you know about trying to become a professional guitar player and, and not doing insurance for a living right um, so yeah, that that was kind of an important moment. And then you know I met Zach and got to hang out and stuff in the in the factory down there. I had a bunch of photos taken with him and stuff. I remember. So factory is that the Gibson factory? Yeah, in London. Yeah, so just wow. off of uh, Tottenham Court Road. No kidding. See, yeah. so what would be the year on this? Would it be early two thousands? Oh god, this was maybe two thousand and. Two, three, wow, possibly something like that. Yeah, yeah. so you had the Epiphone line out, or maybe 2005. Actually, it just came in my head. Yeah, maybe then it was. Maybe so, then. And how's that experience for you? Being like a legendary oh, player that great. you idolized, yeah. right? I mean, I, I literally just didn't. I mean, I had a guitar and he had a guitar, and I just shut the fuck up and just. <laughs> I was just watching him, you know, like he's just ripping. I think we actually had a conversation about this first time I met you at that uh, Lake Worth show in Florida years and years ago. Mm. I think we were talking about. No Rest for the Wicked album. Oh, yeah. They were one of the best damn Zach Wilde albums outside of No More Tears, right? Yeah. Where he's just like, you know what else? Okay, I what, still listen to it. What's your favorite solo off that album? Uh, probably Devil's Daughter or like, I mean, Miracle Man is like the classic one, but. Devil's Daughter, dude. Devil's Daughter. All day. I mean, the hybrid picking skill, you need to be able to play that. I mean, I mean, some people might go, yeah, what are you talking about? It's fucking easy. But I, I don't know. I had to do it for uh, like Lick Library. And I, I remember that challenged me the most, you know, trying to get that super tight. So, because it's easy for those notes to blend into to one another when you're doing hybrid picking that fast. Right. So to try and get the the, the articulation is the, the hardest thing. That's but, crazy. Yeah, yeah man. Um, that was. 
But yeah, I still listen to that record now. I love it. That's all was nuts. So have you ever had hit one of his Gibsons or one of his Epiphones, those signature models? Uh, yeah, well, the, one of the prizes was um, you got given a, an Epiphone bullseye. I think there's a video of you playing it. Possibly, I don't know. I mean, I don't have the, the I don't have the guitar anymore. But I remember he had his guitar there, and I just remember the sh the low string was just super thick. I think he might have had a ten and then uh, a sixty on the low, because I know he for some Black Label Society songs he just tunes the E string all the way down to whatever B and then leaves the rest of the guitar in standard tuning or whatever. But I just remember the action was super low, super thick strings, and it was just like. How the fuck are you playing this thing? But yeah, he was just ripping on it. I mean, it was great to just watch it in person, honestly. Have you played one of his wild audio guitars? I haven't, no. Those, those are some badass guitars. Right. I like the design he's getting with the finishes. It's going yeah, really they're cool. Like the, the kind of bottom horn is actually a little bit... He has what kind of looks like a Mockingbird. Yeah, kind of. I forgot what it's called. Oh, I saw it, yeah. Odin? No. Is it the Odin? I think it's the T or something. It's right. a longer name. Mm. Um, but it looks like this, and it, it took a while to get out. Um, I think it came out last year, finally came out earlier this year. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. No, I, I thought you meant like the, the Les Paul shaped one with the kind of like, because it's got the. Oh, that one, one is the one. Right, yeah, right. The I'm the one that looks like this, though. Oh, okay. Thorax. Right. It's called Thorax. Okay. Yeah, really good looking guitar. I mean, and they hold their value pretty well. Mm. Yeah, they hold their value pretty And that's checked you're making those, right? Right. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think now's a good time to bring this in just for the sake that we're talking about this. It's a little nerdy, wow, but check this out. Look at this. Yes. Oh, he did see it a little bit earlier, so you can't totally <laughs> surprise. But uh, yes, okay. <laughs> no, no, my surprise They don't know like, that, though. Look at this. But we'll give people yeah, a little sum up. Yeah, this was a body find. This is a Zach Wilde prototype Epiphone signature acoustic. Hope I got that all right. But it is a buzzsaw. It's orange on the inside. Found it at uh, Franklin Guitar Works, MIRC. It's been there for probably 10 years. And... Uh, and uh, this was never supposed to be a guitar. So they just had the body. But look at the extreme cutaway. And then I had my buddy at Hoxie Guitars build um, the bridge. And this is exactly the shape of what it was on it. Right. And it's a two-piece aluminum bridge with the aluminum matching neck. Yes. Black I mean, and lace. the neck is super heavy on that. And it's chambered, though. Yeah. And it's... It's pretty heavy. It's cool, man. It's got some weight to it. Um, and then Tim over at uh, Franklin Guitar Works did the electronics, and this thing is totally wild. Two different inputs. It's just <laughs> no like, pun intended. dude, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No pun intended. No pun intended. Um, and uh, there it is. We'll get some more videos on that to come. All right. So, outside of getting an incredible show, when you go see Five Finger Death Punch, you see Andy tear it up. You offer something really special that you don't see a lot of players. Offering and that's an incredible VIP package, right? Yeah, thought of that. So, um, it's on my website, andyjamesstore.org. Um, you can go on there, all the uh, details about the VIP experience are on there. But, yeah, you know, people they get um, a BC Rich signature Andy James guitar, um, and then they can come out, hang out, um, it backstage, and you know, just ask me a bunch of questions or stuff. We'll just generally hang out, whatever, get some photos, talk about anything you want, um, get like a, a tour of all the, the rig and stuff as well. They get to meet my guitar tech boy and takes them through all of how everything works and, and all the rest of it. So yeah, like it's an awesome experience to just come out and see behind the scenes of everything. And and yeah, like, you know, we, we got a bunch of uh, pictures on there, on there now with, you know, people with their guitars and stuff. And then I, I stage play the guitar as well. So I sign it and then, you know, play it for a song and, and do all of that. I mean, Chris, uh, the, the bass player, he's been, he's been doing this for a while, kind of. He's like, man, you should get on that shit. You know, people love that stuff. So I was thinking, yeah, you know, that'd be, it'd be a nice experience to kind of bring some fans out that want to kind of come and hang and, um, and get the experience, you know. And for the price, I don't know if you want to talk about price on this video, but I mean, for what you just described, getting a stage-played guitar, meeting you, signing it, pictures, experiencing the show, I would think that you'd probably be somewhere like the maybe $4,000 range. Right. I mean, and you're where at this? It's, it's two and a half. But so twenty five hundred dollars, but yeah. dude, your signature model I believe is twenty two, twenty three hundred dollars. Yeah. So you're telling me for just a little couple hundred bucks more, mm. the fan gets to do all of that. Yeah. And just kind of come and hang out. That's yeah, a I steal. Mean, That's a steal. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I mean, some people have kind of been like, "Fuck, man, this is way too much money." But you know, it's. I guess it's. It's the thing where, like, if people really want to do this kind of experience and stuff, then 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 they'll, you know, they'll right, they'll do it. But if they don't, then they won't. You know, it's, it's totally it's not for everybody, I suppose. Right. But. Well, that's a great deal though, because 
I mean, just to get the guitar alone is going to run you that. And then you get to meet the guy who's, who's behind it? Yeah. Who, that's a great deal. It's very cool. And you're also doing a clothing line too, right? Well, yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've got like, you know, wristbands and repping, uh, merch and hat. And Why aren't you wearing the uh, Shred King Burger King shirt? <laughs> oh, mate, that <laughs> thing, I mean, I don't, I don't think, actually, I'm probably about the same weight as like the last time I, when you gave me that shirt and it didn't fit back then. <laughs> okay. So it doesn't, it doesn't fit me now either, but it was a cool idea. I just no. wish it was two sizes bigger. Yeah, I, I mean, what? I ain't like you, mate. I don't no. fucking, you know. <laughs> I just, but the, the problem comes with that is, like, when you wear stuff that's bigger, it, it, it's baggier in, in, like, the body. So, like, um, when we designed these jerseys, that was very much the case of, like, well, you could wear it a bit looser, but let's take it in, like, a little bit. So now, like, these jerseys, they, they fit fairly loose, but they don't, they don't bag out. Right. So, you know, you can wear them and they still hang nicely. That's good, yeah. Which is usually yeah. my, my complaint with a lot of merch. It's either too short in the body or, like, it's a really weird shape or you literally just have to have no shape at all for it to kind of fit. Whereas I'm a sort of fairly averagely built person, you know. I don't, I'm don't. i not, like, mega fat. I'm not super thin either, you know what I mean? So it's, like, just stuff that fits properly. And So, yeah, we, we try to really concentrate on doing that with, like, the T-shirts, the, the hoodies and the the jerseys and stuff like that, just so it could fit most average human beings, but kind of still look fairly sleek and slimming without it being like super right. skin tight, you know what I mean? So let me ask you this then, you know, with, with like music in, in style, even wrestling in, in style and fashion, a lot of times you'll see collaborations take place between brands. I mean, Korn had their sneakers released through Adidas. Those sold out like super fast. Right, yeah. If you could collaborate with a well-known clothing brand and do an Andy James line, what, who would it be? I mean, I'd wear a lot of Nike gear, so it'd probably be Nike, but I don't know if they'd be interested in doing anything with me. But, yeah, I mean... You go for Nikes? Yeah, I mean, like, because you can customise all that stuff as well. So the good thing yeah. about that is, like, I mean, they've brought out... Um, you know, normal lines that you can buy in the shop or whatever. So, but I really like because we were talking about the high tops earlier. Yes. Like my favourite Nikes are the uh, are the, the the ones that I usually wear, which are the high tops, but they're just white sole, black with the white tick on them, and then they have like the ankle strap band on them. Yes. Well. Um, but I, I take that off. But that's the the style. Good, yeah, um, I do it too. I the always... Air Force One. That's what. Okay. It is. Yeah, that's yeah. what. It is. Yeah. 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 I always pull the uh, straps off and put the tongues. Raise the tongues up. Yeah, and then uh, put the jeans in beyond the tongues. Yes, yeah. dude, exactly. Marty McFly, that shit, yeah, man. It exactly. was cool. Yeah. And you know what's crazy, too, is that you see, like, this is so unguitar related, but I love it. So you see, like, the, the new business casual is guys in suits with Nike Air Force Ones. Right. It's becoming a very common thing. Or, or, or like, or they'll wear like what look like uh, slippers that you would wear like just being at home drinking tea with no socks on. I don't That's really true too. That. You gotta wear the really high pants though too, so it shows the ankle. You get exactly. the skin in that, right? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's it's changing. The style is changing dramatically. We were talking about that in like some of the crazy Bill and Ted Adidas I told you about. Yeah. Again, just massive high tops. You know, the way I look at it is this: if you're if you're not gonna wear Zach Wild boots, hmm. right? And you can't, and those are hard to find, by the way. Like, right. finding a good boot is fucking... Yeah, I know what you mean. I do have some, actually. Not, they're not, like, you know, Zach Wild ones. But, but like, ones that you can tuck the jeans in when yeah, they look you cool? Yeah, you can do that, yeah. Kind you of know, like the crow sort of buzz, you know. I was just going to say that, dude. Yeah. That's the goal. It's the crow boot. The yeah. one he got in a dumpster yeah. and puts on. I know. That's a great look. Yeah. That's why, I would do, that's why I used to wear boots all the time. They all look like the crow boots. That's yeah. what I would go for. And those are not easy to find, bro. No, they're not. Then you get these Doc Martens, you're wearing a skin tight and look like Marilyn Manson. What the, if you want to wear that, that's cool. That works, yeah. but it's not my style. I want it more where you can tuck the damn jean in. Yeah. You know, so it's hard, dude, to find that. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, they killed it last night too. Marilyn Manson. Yeah, no, hell they've, of a they've show been great on this tour, man. It's just been a great comeback for him. I've, I've watched it like almost every night, and it's great. But uh, yeah, last night I um I actually took the time to watch a funeral portrait. Yeah. Kind of sort of Fallout Boy machine, uh, My Chemical Romance kind of. Buzz, but they got their own thing on it. But they sound incredible live, really good. Really? Yeah, and then yeah. slaughter, slaughter to prevail as well. Like <laughs> Alex, man, he's a trip. Like I mean, on stage he's just so angry, and then like backstage he's like the nicest guy. And he's got this like massive scar like down his face. It's super cool. And I was thinking, fuck, how did you get that? And he just did it. Really? He gave himself the scar. Just fucking went in and, and gave himself like a designer scar. Really? Yeah. That's a new thing. <laughs> Forget the tattoos on the face. We'll do a designer scar. Yeah. There really? you go. Yeah. It's one more personal. One that looks cool. Or you could get one that's just like a knife wound down like the eye like that, you know. We're bringing it back to the crow again. Okay, let's talk about it. <laughs> <Right? laughs> yeah, the crow. Yeah, speaking of actually that, um, how do you feel about the sequel of the crow? I mean, 
I, I haven't seen it, so I can't really comment. Have you heard the reviews about it? I mean, they've, they've been less than favorable. But look, here's the thing. This is, this is like the, the, the problem that I have when, when new stuff comes out is everybody freaks out about, no, it's not this, it's not that. It's like bringing out a new version of anything doesn't erase the, uh, the you can still watch that. You can still love whatever it is, you know, whether it be like bands or movies or whatever. Um, and if the new one sucks, it sucks. And if it's good, then it's good. But it doesn't, but, you know, people sort of behave like it cancels out like the old one and then it's not going to exist anymore. You know what I mean? Right. So I don't know. I mean, am I, I'm not that keen on the pictures that I've seen. I remember seeing an ad map for that movie when they advertised that Bill Skarsgård was going to be, yeah. and they made it look like he, he was, you know, with yeah. the long black hair. Right. And, and I was thinking, fuck, if he looked like that, it would be killer. Right. But then it comes out, he's just got like weird fur coats and a mullet. You know what I mean? It was slightly, yeah. slightly different. They call it a Spotify rapper look. Right. Right. Okay. So Andy, where can everybody follow you at? Um, on Andy James guitar, Instagram. Uh, and Facebook as well. I have like a main Facebook uh, with the blue tick. And um, you can go and check out my web store, andyjamesstore.org. And, VIP. Uh, check it out. Yeah, check it out. I mean, there's guitar tabs on there and backing you, tracks and merch and uh, everything that I, I do is on that site. And you have a YouTube channel too? I do, yeah. Uh, it's a Flow Evo YouTube channel. Uh, but, you know, Andy James, it, it, it comes up anyway. You okay. Can find it, so. Okay, hell yeah. And make sure to follow us at Masters of Shred on Instagram, at Mr. Shred on Instagram. And subscribe to the channel, shred the notification bell so you get more Talking Shred episodes and new excursion episodes. Thank you for watching this video. And did you check out the Super Halen amp in the background? Yeah, we'll have a link. You can check those out too. They're pretty cool. <laughs> I think you'll dig them. They're limited to just 50. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.